Proudly broadcasting from the Richard Philip Cavallaro Studio. W-W-R-H-U. Hempstead. You discovered. You discovered. A cornerstone of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication. W-W-R-H-U. Get ready, Hofstra fans. Hofstra Pride Sports are finally back. After a year filled with uncertainty, the fall sports are ready to take the field and the court once more. This spring, we will see the return of field hockey. Is it in? Warning. Stop. Slurred with the shot. Slurred finds the back of the net. Volleyball. Tipped over, dug up by Martinovich. Sibis going back for Dimitriadis. That'll do it. Dimitriadis gets the kill in the second set to end it. Women's soccer. And folks, you can put this one in the books. Your Hofstra Pride women's soccer team has captured the Colonial Athletic Association crowd. And men's soccer. The kick, and he scores. Matthew Bowinkle, a new career high, nine goals. This is the Fall Sports Preview Show. Hello all, and welcome to the Locker Room's Fall Sports Preview Show in the spring here on the Hofstra Alternative Web Channel. My name is DJ Lopes, and joined roughly six feet away from me is my very good friend and colleague, the wonderful, the magical, Jesse Lindell. Jesse, how you doing? I am doing very well, DJ. This is a very exciting time for Hofstra sports and a lot of sports in general because after all the uncertainty this last year because of the COVID-19 pandemic, if and when sports would return, fall sports are back, as you mentioned, in the spring Better late than never, and I am so excited that we get to see some of these Hofstra Pride fall teams in action this spring. As am I, and once again, you can stay tuned on all of the thing, all of the things going on tonight for the show on the School of Calm Instagram all night. We will be doing that at WRHU Sports on Insta and Twitter. Once again, WRHU Sports on Insta and Twitter. So, uh, in order to really go into field hockey and what they are going to be doing in the rest of the year, we must go to the before times in 2019. When I could hug you, (laughs) I could go to Hafusa and, you know, not wear a mask and be able to eat there, actually, not have to bring it back to my dorm room. That's right. We're talking about the before times, the 2019 Hofstra field hockey team. Uh, It was the first year of Courtney Vino's tenure. Um, They were 8-10, and and 2-4 in conference play, but they started out 0-4, which means they closed the season off on an 8-6 and tear, which is some of the more impressive field hockey they played in recent memory. Um, They were 5-13 in 2018. Um, This is their most win since 2016. So, Jesse, especially in the later end of the season, what were you seeing from that team that impressed you so much and gave you some reason to look forward to the future? It's how they finished. You mentioned it, 0-4 to start conference play. They got off to a bit of a slow start in the year, but they finished strong, and that's something that they wanted to take into next year. Of course, it would take a little longer to take the field than we thought. But nevertheless, the way that they finished last year, especially against a pretty good CAA team, like Northeastern, a team that has multiple top 10 scores in the CAA. And that's something that a lot of the players and the coaches felt good about going into next year. Kind of end the season on a good note. Courtney Vino's first year as head coach, something to build on going into year two, a three-win improvement from 2018-19, or excuse me, from 2018 and then 2019, the additional three wins. And they're looking to carry that momentum Into this year, not off to the best start after dropping the first two games, which we'll get into a little bit later on, but they're still looking to trend even further up in the right direction. Of course, and they've got some returning stars from that team. Uh, Leading goal scorer, Cammie Larson, 11 goals last year. Um, They returned Juna Slort, five goals last year. Some of the people that I'm looking forward to especially is some of the freshmen that are now sophomores this year. Um, Later on in the season, you could see them really start to get chemistry going. Um, And you could really see that with the freshmen. Mercedes Curry had a couple goals later on in the season. Sydney Laguillo was starting to really uh, get herself going in this offensive system. She also had two goals scored towards the end of the season. Um, What were you seeing as far as their their offense was looking? Their offense was a little bit top-heavy, I think it's fair to say. Cammie Larson, of course, leading the way with 11 goals. Madison Warfel, who had eight last year, she graduated. Juna Slort had five. Nobody else had two, and they were outscored by 21 goals last year. So on offense, they need some of these younger players, like you mentioned, like a Laguillo, for example, uh, like a Curie, to kind of take 
that next step forward as they go into their sophomore season, and they need some supporting players around their main scorer in Cammy Larson. Of course, of course. And also, as we talk about the offense, we have to talk about the defense because there was a lot of standouts there as well. Uh, notably, at the time, freshman goalkeeper Merline Vandevet uh, really put on a show after coming in, uh, kind of came into the starting role a little later into the season, started the last 16 games of the season, had 99 saves, and an over 500 record overall. Um, what were you seeing out of her, especially? Um, as the season kind of got on, she got more comfortable and was getting really a lot of shots to stop and was stopping a good amount of them. You said it perfectly right there. She got a lot of shots taken at her. Hofstra was outshot 16-9 to on average last year. That's a seven-shot difference, which is a lot. A lot and of she Exactly. She had a lot of work to do in the net every single game, but she showed up and she fought hard. And it showed in the stats. She was first in save percentage in the entire CAA, second in total saves, allowed just two and a half goals per game. That's middle of the pack in the CAA. So you would think, okay, she's a middle of the pack goalkeeper, but when she's had that many shots taken on her and she was first in save percentage, she's only a sophomore. And so she could be one of the best, if not the best goalkeeper in the CAA for years to come. And you saw glimpses of that last year with how she was able to hold down the net and keep the pride in a lot of close games. I definitely agree. She plays a very aggressive brand of goalkeeping, which can sometimes be to her detriment, but more often than not is to her uh, to her advantage, being able to get out there and stop all different shots in the defensive third. Yeah, absolutely. And, well, we talked a lot about what happened last year with this Hofstra Pride field hockey team. Coming up, we're going to get into what to expect this year as well as listen to senior defender Frankie O'Brien. But before we do all that, we have a sports update with Eddie Fitz. Thanks, guys. The New York Islanders are not on the ice tonight after picking up a 4-2 victory over the Boston Bruins. The team is currently traveling up north for a two-game series with the Buffalo Sabres. Puck drop is at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Elsewhere in the Eastern Division, Brian Russ netted two goals for the Pens in their 6-3 victory over the Washington Capitals. That loss puts the Isles at the third spot in the division ahead of the Caps. You can listen to every minute of Islanders action right here all across the New York Islanders radio network. On to the hardwood now where the NBA is all out with a star-studded Valentine's Day lineup. The Spurs and Hornets just tipped off. At 7.30, Damian Lillard and the Portland Trailblazers eye up Luka Doncic. At 8, reigning MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo and Shea Gilgis-Alexander go toe-to-toe as the Thunder and Bucks tip off from OKC. And the league champion Lakers are scheduled for a rematch of the Western Conference Finals as they take on the Joker and his Nuggets at 10 p.m. In MLB news, the New York Mets have signed relief pitchers Tommy Hunter and Mike Montgomery to minor league contracts. This coming after the news that Seth Lugo will miss the beginning of the season due to his bone spurs in his elbow. Across the subway, the Yankees will also have to retool their pitching as lefty James Paxton has agreed to a one-year, $8.5 million deal with the Seattle Mariners. Paxton said his goodbyes to Yankees fans via Twitter earlier today. With your sports update, I'm Eddie Fitz. Now let's send it back to DJ and Jesse for the rest of the field hockey segment of the Fall Sports Preview Show on the Hofstra Alternative Web Channel. Back here in the field hockey half hour here on the fall sports, fall sports preview show here in the spring. Jesse Lindell here with DJ Lopes. And we had, or I had the chance to talk to defender Frankie O'Brien on her thoughts going into what is considered the 2020 field hockey season. And she gave an interesting piece of information on what her role is going to be this year. So stay tuned to find out that. And without further ado, let's take a listen. So we are here with defender for the field hockey team at Hofstra University, Frankie O'Brien. Of course, field hockey is a fall sport. Did not happen because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It got pushed off to the spring. What was your initial reaction? What was the team's reaction? What was that day like? I mean, I, everyone was bummed, obviously. I, I, we were not the only ones that experienced this either. I think all sports in unison were like, it was a little bit expected. Um, seeing what happens spring sports, but again, just like bumped. 
there was a lot of uncertainty. We didn't know if we were going to get that season back at first. And then when we did hear about that, we were getting our season back. We were absolutely pumped and psyched. And I actually think that hearing that we wouldn't have a season let us working the let us working so much harder in this fall when we would have had our season for the spring season. We worked so much harder because of it. We were just like so thankful to be able to have a season from in the spring at least even though it's not our full season we still get to have a season so we worked really hard and yeah i'm really basically we're just all really thankful that we get a season at all and that they're allowing us to do this so when did you find out that you're going to have a season what was that feeling like was it very rewarding to know that that extra hard work was going to pay off um yeah it it absolutely was i think we found out in August, I want to say that our season was definitely going to be pushed. And we were found when we found out we were getting a season at all, we were like, okay, we'll believe it when it happens. Like, we're all going to believe it when it happens. It's so unreal that we have a game coming up on Friday. And my mindset still is like, all right, I'll believe it when it happens. Like, when we step on that field, I'll believe it. So, on the field, the team went 5 and 13 in 2018, 8 and 10 last year, or two years ago, I should say. So, that's a three win improvement what adjustments did the team make on the field to have it show up better in the standings i mean it we completely rebuilt on and off field we had a, a brand new head coach our associate head coach going to our head coach courtney vino and i mean she came in with a plan and that's that's huge we completely revamped it was like you need to have this mindset that you're growing as a player in all aspects, that you're relentless on and off the field in all aspects. And that like, there's this sense of like, we have each other's back and that we, we want to be there and we want to be here for the right reasons. Cause not everyone gets the opportunity that we have as division one athletes. So I think that the biggest change that I saw was the structure. Uh, we became a more structured program, a more organized program our goals were clear and outlined, and through that, we knew what we had to do to become a better, uh, ultimately a better program on the field. Was it nice to stay in house and have some familiarity with Coach Dino? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Courtney you know, e- knew each and every single one of us. And the interesting aspect is that we knew her as a coach and as a person. But I don't think, I think what was most interesting was that Courtney took on this head coaching position and there was so much like, okay, we know Courtney is an associate coach. What is she going to do differently as a head coach? And she completely gave our program like, oh, it, the best way to put it was like a facelift. She completely revamped our program in ways that I never saw coming and never saw coming in such a short period of time. And something that was also very interesting is she didn't bring in a bunch of new people. She worked with who we had, and we became better with the people that she already knew. It wasn't so much like going from a team that didn't want to be here from now wanting to be here. It was using the people that we had and showing us why we're here and showing us that what we can do with who we have and showing us that like we are capable of becoming a better team that we're better than five and 13 and that we just need to believe in ourselves in 2018 a team went two and four in conference play same record in 2019 year two under coach vino what adjustments does the team have to make to get over that hump and make it to the caa tournament Conference play is a bit different. I definitely think that we need to keep growing as a team on field specifically. Um, we're in, right now working with how dynamic we are in the backfield and then going up the field to our former line, line transitioning, transitioning fa- faster from defense to offense and capitalizing more when we're scoring goals. And we have been doing that at practice. So I think we'll see a much different outcome this season. So this is your fourth year on the team what are some of your personal goals and some of the team goals that you have personal goals would definitely just to grow specifically as a player this year i would love to maybe i would like to increase my stamina i've been working really hard on being able to stay in the game more physically and stay in that better shape I would like to score some goals. I'm in somewhat of a new role this year, going from defense to offense. I would love to get on the scoreboard um, or create plays for goals to be scored, setting up other people. That would be awesome. As a team, 
all I can really ask for is that everyone's whole heart is in it all the time. I really want these people. We have a very young team, and I want them to do their best, and I want everyone to believe in each other, and I want the sense of camaraderie to continue because there, there's such a strong sense of camaraderie right now in practice and hard work, and I would love to see that just go throughout the season and take us a little bit farther than 8-10 and 10 from last year. Um, I would love to also continue with this mindset of growth. I think we've been growing so much as a team and even having like half of our roster be freshmen and sophomores. I think that we have so much potential to grow even more this season and to continue to increase our record. I would love that. What is your role on the field going to be this year? Because you've played defense for essentially your whole career here at Hofstra. You just mentioned trying to get on the on the stat sheet on the offensive side. So what are you going to be doing this year? Right now it's looking as a midfield, attacking midfield position right mid. I have have over this quarantine, over this long break that we've had, had a lot of time to get into better shape. And I will put that on myself a little bit and say it's not so much that I couldn't have done that before. But again, it's all about mindset. And I've gotten into this right mindset and this mindset where, like, I want to score and I want to get up there and I want to be in this shape where I can score goals and, like, be in the game longer. So, yeah, I'm playing right mid a little bit more, a little bit more physically tiring, but we'll see what happens. This next one's a question I'm sure you've heard on the program before. It's always like, it's always what we like to do to conclude interviews here on Preview Show. Hofstra wins the CAA. Hofstra, this is easy. Hofstra wins the CAA if we're all in it all the time and we have each other's backs. We're doing it together. Well, it sounds like a great mantra and a great mentality going into the season. Defender Frankie O'Brien, or now I should say midfielder attacker. Frankie there we Bryan, go. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Once again, big thanks to Frankie O'Brien for being able to sit down with Jesse and do an interview. And the biggest takeaway, uh, you know, she spoke a lot about growth and constantly improving as a team, which I am all for. I feel like this team has been very good at that over the course of the years. But she mentioned another thing, a change in her role. She's been a defender her whole career now, going to move to midfield, attacking midfield, which, um, you know, looking at her, pre- her previous stats, she's a very good uh, creator. She can get a lot of people going. She had seven assists last year which is, you know, very good. Added a goal on top of that. So I think she's a very good creator. Uh, Jesse, how do you think that she will be able to make this transition uh, into this offense? It's interesting because, as you mentioned, yes, she has been a defender her whole career, but she's an experienced player. She said it in the interview that she's worked on her stamina. She's worked at being able to hang in there a little bit longer, and she's going to try to take that onto the offensive side now. What kind of surprises me, though, is that she's a senior and they're making her do this. I would, I, I figured some of the people we mentioned before, Mercedes Curie, Sydney Laguillo, that they were going to hopefully take that big step up. I believe Frankie O'Brien can do it. She's one of the leaders on this team. She was one of their best defenders, so it might leave a little bit of a hole on defense. Now she's not going to be playing there as much, if at all. But I'm interested to see how it turns out for her. But I'm also a little bit curious as to why they're not trying to utilize some of the younger players. Are they not as developed as we thought? Do they see something in Frankie O'Brien that we don't? I'm interested to see it, but I'm also a little bit curious as to why they're doing so. Um, I think perhaps the answer to that question might be um, in kind of the break that this team has had. You know, they, they haven't been able to play games in over a year. So, you know, when you get back to this time where you're actually being able to, to play games and it's not just practicing anymore, um, you kind of you want to have some familiarity in that offense. So instead of maybe looking to one of the nine freshmen that are coming in, which, by the way, uh, they have a lot of returners, but they have an impressive uh, freshman class coming in, uh, you're going to want some familiarity in that offense. And I think Frankie, Bryan, Frankie O'Brien brings that. Um, she's been very experienced with this team, with the systems that they can run. And I think that uh, being able to make that transition into from defense to offense will be able to work just fine for her. But then again, uh, this is a preview show. We don't quite know what that's <laughs> going to be yet, but we can always look forward, which we're ex- exactly what we're going to do now um, because uh, we're looking forward to this team now, this season. We've already had a bit of an introduction to the season, 
Uh, they played two games already. They lost one to nothing to Temple and five to nothing to UConn. Uh, Jesse, what are some things that you saw in those two games about this team? Well, offensively, there's been hardly anybody show up on the stat sheet at all. Cammy Larson, the leading scorer on the team and one of the best in the CAA, hasn't even taken a shot yet. Against Temple, it was Juna Slort. She took the only shot. And against UConn, it was... I um, forget who it was who took the shot, but there was only one shot taken as well from Hofstra. So they have not gotten the ball off at all. And it, it makes me a little bit concerned that they haven't had anybody that was able to get past any defenders, get any open shots to take on the goal. They haven't showed up at, basically at all on the offensive side of the score sheet. And I understand it's a young season, still some new players, especially Frankie O'Brien playing more offense, so there's some new players to get acclimated into this offensive scheme. But the fact that there's been hardly anything to show up on the score sheet, no goals, just two shots taken in two games, it's kind of concerning. And it has to turn around quick because Merline Vandervet, she's still doing well in goal, but she's still getting a lot of shots taken on her. UConn. She made 10 saves. She allowed five goals. That's 15 shots taken against her. So she still took a lot of heat back there in net. And so Hofstra has to be able to accompany that by scoring more goals. Uh, Definitely. And I think that something that we're kind of seeing right now is that teams are starting to have more of a look into what Cammie Larson has has done over the past couple of years. Uh, You know, there's a bit more film on her. There's a lot more things that you can game plan around. So this is where... um, that kind of cohesiveness that this offensive had uh, towards the end of the season. This is where um, people like Cindy Laguillo and Mercedes Curry have to really step up, and then also Junis Lord as well. Um, a lot of people have to step up on this side because the thing is, is that Cammy's not always going to get those shots. Uh, now you know you're going to have to look at other ways to get those shots, and uh, you know you really have to find ways to get the offense going. When, when Cammy's not going. It is important to mention, however, that these are two pretty good teams that they were facing. Um, you know, Temple had a couple players that were preseason all Big East uh, consideration. And UConn is a very good team, even had the co-defensive player of the year last year uh, in the Big East and Cheyenne Sprecher. So I think that it also has a lot to do with the level of talent they're facing. You know, they're not facing any slouches at the beginning of the year, which is at times, especially with the break that they've had, A little tough to get the offense going at that rate, so I think we can see improvement, but I think that there is a little bit of concern as far as offensive developments of plays uh, to be seen from these first two games. And I will say this, is that Northeastern was a little bit outside the top 25 in the rankings according to RPI. They were on the brink of being one of the ranked teams, and they beat them to finish the season last year. So they can have a signature victory like that, and they could play well against some really good teams this season. But what I really think it comes down to is finding the number two scorer on this team. As we mentioned earlier, Madison Warfel graduated. Juna Slort had five goals. Nobody else had two. So when the defenses that they face really focus on Cammie Larson, which seems to be what happened the first two games, they're going to need somebody else to go to if they want to put points on the board because they – have only two shots in two games. That is nowhere near close to getting it done. They have some players who have the ability to become kind of the Robin to Batman and Cammy Larson, but they are going to have to figure that out soon because they are not off to the best start on offense right now. I certainly agree, and uh, unfortunately this is kind of the end of our preview, but not for right now because we will be going to a, a preview on the new members of the roster and the roster at large. So, here you go. The Hofstra Pride field hockey team has had a long time to dwell on last season. And after what will be 15 months since they beat Northeastern 4-3 in the season finale last November, the Pride are finally ready to get back on the field. The team held an 8-10 record last season, which is the most wins the program has had since the 2016 campaign. Cammie Larson led the team in 2019 with 25 points, including 11 goals and 3 assists, as well as a team-high 4 game-winning goals, while Madison Warfel added 25 points with 8 goals on the year, along with leading the team with 9 assists. 
Here's a chance. There's another one. A follow-up opportunity and this one's tied. At one end, it's Vanderbilt keeping it a one-goal game. And moments later, Werfel buries it and ties this game 2-2. Moving forward into the new year and new season, second-year head coach Courtney Vino will try to lead Hofstra back to the CAA tournament for the first time since 2015. This season, the Pride will have seven games in CAA play, paired with a non-conference schedule highlighted by road trips to play Temple and the University of Connecticut to start off the season. Also of note, this season Hofstra plays 8 out of 14 games at home, which gives the Pride some form of home field advantage in this pandemic shortened season. In addition, the last 6 games of the regular season are all CAA conference games including a meeting with all 4 CAA playoff teams from last year, Northeastern, JMU, William & Mary, and the defending champs Delaware Blue Hens. It's a new season for the Pride and with that comes a new freshman class. Esme Verduz from the Netherlands will try to fill the vacant spot in the midfield left by recent grad Madison Warfield. Another rookie, Liv Trong, from Lafayette Hill will be tasked with helping bolster the Pride's defense that allowed nearly three goals a game last season. Her Pennsylvania-based teammate and third member of the Pride's freshman class, Megan Riley from Bluebell, will be inserted as a backup goaltender behind sophomore netminder Merline Vandervet to start the season. Pride will also see many of their top contributors from last season return to the field. Highlighted by junior midfielder Cammie Larson, along with fellow defenseman Juna Slort, who will be looking to improve on a season where she finished second on her team behind Larson with 33 shots taken, as well as shots on goal with 20. Even though the 2020-2021 season may look a little different than seasons in the past due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the end goal for the Hofstra Pride remains unchanged and that is to raise the CAA trophy at the end of the season. For WRHU Sports, I'm Max Milstein. Much thanks for the work on that project to Max Milstein, uh, Bo Dragone, Ethan Tanzer, Rocco Law, and Vinny Las Penuso. Thank you very much. It was very good work. Uh, so moving on, Jesse, we're in the waning minutes of our time here, which is unfortunate. I could talk all day about this, but it is a preview show, so... Jesse, what is your prediction for the Hofstra Pride field hockey team this year? I say that they are a fringe CAA contender. The last two years, they've fallen just short of the tournament, but they did have some signature wins. Last year, it was Northeastern to finish the year. Two years ago, Cammie Larson's late game winner, they won one nothing against James Madison, but then lost the last two games to miss the CAA tournament. This year, I think it's more so the same. They're kind of on the cusp of getting to the tournament but they're going to have to take one or two games that they're not really favored to win, and they're going to have to find a way to edge one out in order to give themselves a good chance. But they have some tough competition. Northeastern is definitely one of them. They have some top 10 goal scorers in the CAA. Delaware, a nationally ranked team, won the NCAA tournament in 2016. So they have a great program there, a great established program, and they're going to have to be able to match up against some of these programs pretty well. And they're going to have to, as I said, maybe win a game or two that they're not favored to win. And if they could do that, then if they can edge those out, then they can get over the hump and get to the CAA tournament, which is where they've been falling short the last couple of years. I certainly agree. I think that this is a team that can make it, and I think that my final prediction is that this is the first year in a little bit that the Hofstra Pride go 500 in CAA play, and I think they can squeak in as one of the last seeds in the CAA playoffs. It absolutely is possible, and it also might come down to tiebreakers in a shortened pandemic season. We'll see how the Hofstra Pride field hockey team does this year. In what is considered the 2020 season, but is happening in the spring of 2021. This concludes the field hockey half hour on the Fall Sports Preview Show here on the Hofstra Alternative Web Channel. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and thank you for everybody who made this half hour possible. Pushing all the right buttons behind the board was Tom Bauer. Working on the Beyond the Pride package was Max Milstein, Bo Dragon, Ethan Tanzer, Rocco Law, and Vinny Las Venuso. And bringing us around the world of sports was Eddie Fitz. For DJ Lopes, I am Jesse Lindell. Make sure to stay right here from... 7.30 to 8. We will be here until 9 o'clock. Coming up next is the volleyball half hour with Grant, Fa Grant Francis and Kayla McKechnie. So stay right here. You're listening to Fall Sports Preview Show here on the Hawk.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Volleyball Half Hour of the Fall Sports Preview Show. I'm Kayla McKechnie, and alongside me today, veteran play-by-play commentator for this volleyball team in his final preview show, Grant Francis. Grant, how are you? How excited are you to talk some hot for volleyball? I'm doing good, and I am even better considering that we are talking about volleyball this half hour. Something that we haven't done, obviously, in uh, quite a long time, given the whole COVID, uh, you know, in 2020 situation. But, God, hearing the... We were talking about it earlier, but hearing the veteran, you know, play-by-play for, for the volleyball team, it's crazy. Just considering uh, it feels like it was just, you know, yesterday that we were uh, getting our first on-sites with the volleyball team and all that good stuff. And now uh, here, here we are at my final uh, sports preview show at the station. It's strange. Definitely. I mean, I know the time is going to fly for me as well, but everybody don't forget to follow along the School of Calm Instagram all night at Herbert School HU. I'm actually the one taking that over. So to just go over there. Well, uh, you can get some uh, previews before the action actually happens and also follow WRHU Sports to catch up on when the games are going to be going on, who's covering those games and to also stay updated. All right. So let's get right into it, Kayla. Before we get into you know, what's upcoming for this team for the following year. We got to talk about what happened last year. Hofstra ends up going 17-12 and 12 overall, 10-6 and 6 through the CAA. Throughout that season, they showed a lot of points where they looked promising. And there was a really optimistic look going into the uh, CAA tournament in which Hofstra hosted last year. Uh, it ended up turning sour, but it was interesting to see their ups and uh, downs last year as you went through the season. Uh, they had some really, really high highs, uh, specifically in the tournament where they had Oregon and Duke all there, St. John's as well. Um, but then they had some lows as well, and uh, that's how the season ended in the CAA tournament. You're right, Grant. I mean, when you define the word heartbreaking, loss in five to Delaware when they were up to... I give the team credit, the fact that they were able to battle through the full five sets. But in volleyball, you know, I I played myself. I've I've played volleyball for about eight, nine years now. Sometimes when all it takes is one point. It takes one point, the mood goes down, and the the negative energy just shifts the court. And that's that's what we saw happen in that final game versus Delaware. And you look at that third set, you know, the the final in that third set is 28 to 26. They had it right there. Uh, And and that is going to be a match that they will look at this year and hopefully use it as um, some motivation, uh, especially going into CAA play. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of changes this year. You have Laura Mishulo, a senior from last year, gone. Louisa Sidlick, a senior from last year, gone. Two of the players that really have been cornerstone players for this volleyball team here at Hofstra. I mean, you just look at their careers. For Laura Mishulo, over 1,700 kills in her career. That's good for 3.71 kills per set played. Louisa Sidlick, almost 4,500 assists throughout her career. Almost 10 assists per set played. That's really tough to match. That is definitely the storyline going into this season, Grant. What is the team going to do without them? Two of the biggest key key players on the court. You know, Louisa Sitlick is the setter. The setter is the most important person on the court. They make the plays. When they're taken out of the play, that's when things can get crazy. They're the ones calling all the shots, and she's the most important player on the court. And for the past four years, Coach Manser has been planning the team around them. And I think the replacement for Laura Mashulo is a little bit more clear because you have Anna Martinovic, who has just been getting better and better and better as she's played for this volleyball team. We'll get into her a little bit more later, but Sidlik is going to be the one that's going to be tough to replace. And there's a big question mark in that setting position. We don't know who's going to be there, but, you know, it, it could be really good. You, you know, you could have a player that comes in and shocks everybody and plays really well. That will certainly be the hope for this volleyball team going into this season. Now we're going to get into much more. We have an interview with Emily Mansour coming up right after this, but first a sports update with JJ Beal. This is JJ Beal with your WRHU sports update. After a thrilling 4-2 win over the Boston Bruins last night, the New York Islanders will look to keep their four game point streak, al- point streak alive as they travel to upstate New York tomorrow night to take on the Buffalo Sabres. You can catch all of that action right here on 88.7 FM WRHU and all across the New York Islanders radio network. From the ice to the hardwood, Hofstra men's basketball fell to JMU for the second straight day by the score of 74-70. Jalen Ray 
led the Pride with 25 points as his counterpart Tariq Coburn contributed 12 points of his own. The Pride will look to get back to their winning ways as they host the Charleston Cougars next weekend. In other games around the CAA, the Northeastern Huskies fell to the Towson Tigers in a stunning upset in the CAA. The Tigers were led by a stellar performance from sophomore guard Nicholas Timberlake, scoring 22 points as Towson snapped their eight-game losing streak. From the CAA to the top 25, the number three Michigan Wolverines outscored the number 21 uh, Wisconsin Badgers 40-20 in the second half to win 67-59 in their first game in three weeks. Hunter Dickinson led the Wolverines with 11 points, 15 rebounds, and 5 blocks as, as Isaiah Livers shipped in with 20 points of his own in the winning effort. In some more top 25 action, the number 22 Ramblers of Loyola Chicago lost an overtime thriller to the unranked Bulldogs of Drake 51-50. After, lo after losing leading scorer Shanquan Hempville, the Bulldogs were able to keep their tournament hopes alive as Tramel Murphy led Drake with 17 points. With your WRHU Sports Update, I'm JJ Beal. Thank you to JJ Beal for that sports update. And, of course, last week I had a chance to sit down over StreamYard and talk to head coach of the volleyball team, Emily Mansur. I always love talking to her. She had some great stuff. Take a listen. Well, Coach Mansur, thank you so much for joining us here on the 2021 Sports Preview Show. And first I want to ask you just, you know, how has practice been going for you guys before you start up this season, given, you know, all the new protocols and things with COVID? How has it all been going? It's going good. It's for sure uh, an adjustment like everything else this year, playing with the mask and just getting used to the new protocol that we have to follow. But it is wonderful to be back in the gym. Our ladies are excited. They are working so hard. And that's all I can ask. I know me, along with everybody else here at the station, are excited for volleyball as well. So I can't imagine how, how excited the, your girls are. Um, now, I want to go back to last season for a second. Obviously, a heartbreaking loss to Delaware there in the fifth set uh, in the tournament. How are you going to use that to inspire your team coming into this season? It's such a hard feeling to have, like, especially we lost at home. We lost in front of the people that we love and being in our our own place that we had to protect. I think that's a feeling that stay with all of us. And I think all the returners plus the coaching staff that's here and is hopefully going to motivate everybody else so we don't have to go through that again because that was so hard. It's I it very hard to not win and not succeed, but doing that at home was 10 times worse. Yeah, and that's sort of the mental side of it, kind of the heartbreaking uh, feeling. But in terms of the actual fundamental side of things, what do you want to see improve from last year coming into this season? I think a big thing for us was just our consistency of finding a level of volleyball that we can play throughout the whole season and not going up and down so much and making a lot of unforced errors. So we really are working very hard to create where it's going to be on the other team to make the errors and we work very hard to keep every point. Uh, it's a younger team. Uh, I was talking to someone, they were like, you guys are not young. I was like, yes, we lost two very big part of our program. So now it's just finding who is going to step up to take those roles again. Yeah, that was actually my next question. You mentioned it, like, you know, not just all of the changes with COVID and everything, but there are going to be a lot of changes to your lineup this year with Laura Machuo gone and Louisa Sidley gone, two of your biggest players over the past few years. How do you think your team is going to handle that transition? It is going to be a transition. I think it's going to take a little time for different student athletes to just feel comfortable taking that leadership role and finding the voice and but like every season, you're going to lose some very important and great players that came through your program, and, and you're going to get new ones that's going to take the leadership. So we're going to go through it. We miss Easy a lot. We miss Lau a lot. But the team that we have here now is going to rise to the occasion. One of the players who I thought really stepped up for your team last year was Anna Martinovic. How has she been developing, and do you expect her to really take a big chunk of that leadership role that, uh, you know, Mikulo and Sidlik are going to leave behind? Absolutely. Anna is someone that we are really expecting to take a big part in our program and just 
being a huge presence. She's been doing a really nice job. But again, when we get to play, it's going to be exciting and interesting to see how she's going to be able to handle everything that comes on being the captain and being the big name that we need her to be. And what, you know, last year or in practice this year, what really impressed you about Ana Martinez and her game? And uh, her ball control, and I think this is something you always have to have one player who has really good ball control, and that's what Anna brings to us. She's not the most powerful. She's not going to score the most points, but she's going to pass really well. She's going to work really hard on defense, and she's going to make smart plays. And I think this is really what she brings. She's just a very good all-around player, and that's what we need her to be this year. She needs to really embrace this role that you're not going to get all the points you may not get your name always spoken about it, but you're going to be the player that's always on the court for us. And, and two of the other big players that you guys brought in last season were Athena Dimitriades and Luz Davina Nunez Sierra. How have they been developing through all of this? And uh, do you expect them to uh, really come into their own this season? Yes, I think it's going to be a big competition for both of them. We have... Uh, other uh, student athletes that's going to be here challenging them, and we want to see them growing and take the lead. I think some of them had a tougher time with COVID, just being able to come back ready to go, and it does take time. So it's going to be a lot of fun to see them competing to keep their spot on the course this year. One player who I also thought really stepped up for you last year was Madeline Matheny as a freshman. Um, do you think you'll expect to see her be more of a uh, staple in your lineup this year throughout the season? I hope so. If that's going to happen, she knows. It's in her hands to make it happen, but I hope so. Madeline is one of a kind. She comes in, she works so hard every day, and she makes changes, which is something that's very hard for all of us. And she's willing to come to practice. And if you tell her, hey, attack the ball with your left hand, she will do what you ask. So I really hope it pays off for her and that she finds her place on the court. What about some of the other players who I haven't mentioned, some of the other ones that, you know, uh, popped into the lineup here and there last year but didn't get a whole lot of uh, playing time? Who are some of those players that you think are really going to be showing their faces a lot this season? I think Mad Maddie Appleton, who last year didn't play as much as she did the year before, she has grown a lot, and I think we're going to see her in different roles this year. I think we're going to see her playing different positions and doing different things. Juliana, who did play last year and is back this year, uh, and I think we're going to see her on the court a lot. And with them, we have a couple of our incoming freshmen that I really think they're going to find a way to break in through the lineup. Uh, we had red shirt last year, Zaire Abdul, who I think it's going to be a big name throughout the next four years at Hofstra. She red shirted last year, but we are excited. We think she's one of those players that's going to go through the painful process of maybe not looking great at the beginning, but in a couple of months, she's going to be one of the best players that we ever had. We really think so. I know you're not going to give away all your secrets, but what can you tell us about some of those newcomers coming in? Is there anybody specifically that fans should watch for? We have Damla, and who is our freshman from Turkey, who I think it's going to be an, a big part of our lineup and uh, breaking in through the middle and challenge the ones that we have here right now playing. Uh, also Bianca. Pucciarelli, who comes from Italy, is another one of our incoming freshmen that I think she's fighting very hard to get her spot on the court. So we'll have a couple of different names. As you know, I don't give much away at the beginning, but we have a couple of different names that's going to be really showing up on the court this year. All right. You've done enough of these interviews to know uh, what we do on the final question. Hofstra wins the CAA if. If we really embrace playing as a team, we don't have a superstar, we don't have a best player, we have to be the best unity that we ever had. All right, well, Head Coach Emily Mansur, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us here on the 2021 Sports Preview Show. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, a huge thank you to Head Coach Emily Mansur. She is always a joy to talk to. And, uh, you know, throughout my time at Hofstra, she's been one of the coaches who I've really, really enjoyed talking to. Uh, but there's a lot to take in from that interview. And it sounds like a lot of optimism to take from what she's saying about her team. 
Absolutely. She says that she doesn't give a lot away, but I feel like you and I were able to kind of pick part this uh, bit by bit and try and try and get a good uh, sense of what's going to come this season. But one thing for me that isn't a surprise to come out of this is that, you know, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, is Anna Martinovic stepping into the leadership role that Laura Mishulo and Louisa Sitlick are leaving behind. And you look at what she's gone through in her years here at Hofstra, 2018. You know, she didn't get a whole lot of playing time that year. She, uh, you know, but, but she got her, her reps in. And that was the year that Hofstra won the CAA tournament. And then last year, you kind of see the opposite. You know, she, she gets some more playing time and she's able to, she's seen a team that won a championship and she's seen a team that may, maybe was on the more disappointing side. But all of that comes together into having experience. And when you're a leader, uh, that's huge to have going into a season. You know what to expect. Anna Martinovic, you can look at how she's just improved from 2018 to 2019. 2018, she had 104 kills through 78 sets played. That's good for about 1.3 kills per set. Last season in 2019, she had 293 kills and 111 sets played. 2.64 kills per set. She nearly doubled her efficiency from 2018 to 2019. That's huge. Yeah, Grant. Also, I talked to Anna Martinovich earlier in the fall back when a lot of things were uncertain. We weren't sure if we were getting uh, a season yet. And I had talked to her on Instagram. I remember I had met, seen on the Hofstra Volleyball Instagram. They were doing these little competitions and they would it, just coach Manser would have them either race on the court or do some sort of drill or do something around the fitness center to win these little trophies and have a group win. And when I talked to Anna, she had mentioned to me, it really just kept the competitive nature of the team up. And I think for her, that's going to be one of the things that she is able to teach a lot of these younger players. And, and as coach Manser said, playing as a team, really gelling as a team, that's how they're going to have success this season and having those little things, especially during a long period of time where you can't really uh, have a lot of team function a lot of uh, close-knit type of stuff uh, that's huge to have it's for for team bonding all that good stuff but another thing that I really liked from that interview is hearing about you know who who we maybe didn't see a whole lot last year who are going to step into their roles this year and one name that really popped out to me she said was Maddie Appleton and the reason why is because in 2018 when Hofstra won the CAA tournament Maddie Appleton was a huge player for them uh, on the defensive side of things as a freshman, she was just lights out for the entire season. We didn't see her that much last year. It was one of the wonders of last season. Uh, and Juliana Vaz came in, and she played well also. But having Maddie Appleton, her saying that she's going to get some more reps this season, I find that very promising for this team defensively. Coach also mentioned that we could see her in different positions, which mm -hmm. I found really interesting. Uh, my mind automatically jumped to maybe she could be a setter since liberos are typically that second help, but I feel like that could be interesting and maybe something that we could see, maybe just a little bit of a tease, but uh, I completely agree with you. That'll be a really interesting story to kind of follow up on and to see her again. For me, you name dropped her, Madeline Matheny. Mm -hmm. For me, she's that player's player. You see her on the bench. She's cheering on the team. She just seems like that positive force in the locker room. She had 97 kills, 37 digs, 12 aces, 11 blocks, and 6 assists. She's only a freshman. That's some pretty impressive numbers for a freshman. And Coach said she could play more as well. And I, I do hope that's the case for her. And it's the work ethic, right? Coach Mansour said she has one of the best work ethics on the team. Obviously, a player like Anna Martinovic does as well if she's improving that much from year to year. This team has a lot of players who are dedicated to the team. Uh, you know, losing Mashulo and losing Sidlik is huge. They're your superstars. But having superstars is not the same thing as having a spread out attack and a balanced attack where you can get offense from all sides of, you know, from everywhere on the court. That is a huge thing because when, when you're a little one-dimensional and you have that all-star in Mashulo, teams are going to key in on her. But when you don't have a player like Mashulo, you don't know where this is going to come from. You have a lot of balanced attack. Obviously, Martinovic is going to get a lot of the uh, reps that Mashulo got. But it's not going to be as much, I wouldn't say. I'd say it's going to be a little bit more balanced, which makes this team a little bit more unpredictable when you're going up against them defensively. One more player I do want to mention really quick is Zaire Abdul-Rahim, who Coach mentioned could be the face of this team in the coming years. Uh, she had, was redshirted last year. She's going to get some reps now this year. She's an outside right side that's always a good dynamic when you're able to play both. You know, while we were listening to the interview here in studio, I asked you, I, was, I said, is she a lefty or a righty? 
being a lefty or a righty, being able to go from right side to outside, that is such a huge advantage in the volleyball world because you are able to read the court really, really well. And I'm, I'll am i be really excited to get to see her on the court this year. Those are two, two of my biggest things that this team needs to have if they want to have a lot of success this year. Number one, obvious answer is the setter. Uh, that's the big question mark. That's the easy, obvious answer. But number two, I'd say the right side. Um, last year, there was no really uh, defined right side, I would say. The year before that, when they won the CAA tournament, Aisha Skinner was huge. Uh, she was, I believe she was the, the rookie of the year that season in the, in the CAA. Uh, she was phenomenal. And having that balanced attack, again, as I said, you had Skinner on that side, you had Mishulo on the other. You didn't know which one it was going to go to, and they were both lethal. If they can get that right side, Madeline Matheny, potentially, if she can really come into her own this year, they're going to be tough to beat. I agree with you. I think if Coach can find a core lineup in the sense where, yes, being able to pl- play a lot of different positions is a great thing. You're, it makes you a really dynamic player. But when you're on the court during the season, if you have girls who are playing that lock positions and can do one thing really well, that's how you get a team like the 2018 team and you win the CAA championship. We're running out of time here, but we got to end on this. Can they make the CAA tournament this year? You mentioned it, you know, it's a team with worth ethic, work work ethic, excuse me. And I think if they can really work hard enough for it and, and adjust to the issues that they made, you know, Coach mentioned the unprecedented errors. I think if they can fix those, it's definitely possible. Six out of the nine teams will make the CAA tournament this year. I don't see Hofstra not being one of them. Coach Mansoor is somebody who always, uh, she has her players playing at their best. That's that's just how she coaches this team. She's been very successful at Hofstra throughout her years. Uh, so I, I, I don't see them missing the tournament. I, I, I really agree don't. with you, Grant. But now we're going to transition to a feature that goes beyond the pride made by Josh Linsenberg, Anthony Roberts, Gabe Zoda, and Matt Traverso, in which we're going to take a look at some of the biggest threats in the CAA for volleyball. It's been 453 days since CAA Volleyball was in action. As the 2021 abbreviated season approaches, let's take a look beyond the pride. One team that is looking to continue their recent success are the Towson Tigers. Last regular season ended in a spectacular CAA record of 16-0 and a 29-3 overall record for the Tigers. They seem to be unstoppable in conference play which was shown when they captured the CAA title in dominating fashion against JMU. More proof of this dominance was their 23-game win streak, which ended with a loss to the 9th-ranked Penn State. This season presents new challenges for the squad since they will have to replace three all-CAA players, which include the CAA setter and player of the year, Marissa Wonders. Although they are losing big pieces, their young players present hope to return to the top of the leaderboards. Some of these players include the all-conference freshman of the year, Lydia Weirs, who was their lead player in blocks and was third in the league with 1.15 blocks per set. Another player who the Tigers can't wait to get back is Emily Jerome. Emily was their top attacker who was also named in the second team all-conference outside hitter. She also ranked fourth in kills per set and racked up a team high 349 kills. Even though the Towson Tigers will look different in this upcoming season, they still plan on continuing their dominance over the CAA conference and fighting for another CAA championship. The University of Delaware Blue Hens are also looking forward to continuing their success in the 2021 season after reaching the semifinals in the 2019 CAA tournament. Despite having a record just above .500 and finishing 6th in the conference with a 6-10 conference record, the Blue Hens were able to defeat Hofstra in the first round of the CAA tournament in an upset victory over the Pride. The Blue Hens will have a much different roster than they had in 2019 with only 7 of their 17 players returning. Of these 7 players, the CAA all-rookie Izigi Bazaranlar who ranked 3rd in the CAA in assists. The Blue Hens are also looking to have younger players fill the shoes of some key departures, namely first-team all-conference outside hitter Maria Bellinger and second-team all-conference defensive force Andy Hunas. Despite these key losses and having a different roster since the 2019 season, the Blue Hens are expecting another successful season. A team that struggled last season looking to get a fresh start is the UNCW Seahawks. 
The Seahawks will be under the direction of new head coach Dottie Hampton. UNCW lost two key players this year, Madison Peters and Kendall Bender who were both top leaders in kills and blocks will not be returning this season. The Seahawks will look to senior Bryn Montgomery and senior Anna Wiseman to lead the Seahawks to victory. Montgomery will be a key role on the offensive drive this year as she was the lead passer for the Seahawks in 2019. A new face on the Seahawks to watch out for is freshman Jaden Barry. Barry was named to Under Armour's All-American watch list her junior and senior seasons as well as named to North Carolina's Volleyball Coaches Association watch list as a sophomore and junior. As the season approaches, CAA teams will have a limited amount of time to prepare, but only time will tell who will come out on top as CAA champions. For WRHU Sports, I'm Joshua Linsenberg. Uh, great job by Josh Lindsenberg, Anthony Roberts, Gabe Zoda, and Matt Traverso, who put together that Beyond the Pride. Well, that'll do it for the volleyball portion of the 2021 Fall Sports Preview Show. Many thanks to everybody who contributed to this half hour of the show. Our engineer has been Tom Bauer. The volleyball talk may be over for this broadcast, but make sure you stay tuned for the rest of the show. Up next will be Max Sacco and Eliza Kravitz bringing you women's soccer. And then closing out the show from 8.30 to 9 will be Andrew Mergolo and Ryan Ginio talking men's soccer. For my co-host Kayla McKechnie, I'm Grant Francis saying thanks so much for listening to the volleyball section of the show and enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Broadcasting from the Richard Philip Cavallaro Studio. WWRHU. Hempstead. You discover, you discover. A cornerstone of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication. WWRHU. Welcome to the Women's Soccer Half Hour of the Fall Sports Preview Show. I'm Eliza Kravitz, and I am joined by my co host, Max Sacco, to preview the new season for the Hofstra Women's Soccer Team. Now, Max, it's been a long time since we've te seen this team in action. It's been about a year and a half. How excited are you to see this team play again? Extremely. This is my second favorite team on campus. We both know what my favorite one will always be, near and yes. dear to my heart, my wrestling boys. But this is my favorite fall sport. I think women's soccer is one of the best teams, and I'm willing to say the best team on campus, period, year in and year out, fall, winter, and spring. This is a strong team. And, Eliza, before we get into it, this is a milestone for you, too, in two ways. First time in, I think, a year and a half you're not producing 
our show, the the preview show and number two, this is your kind of last two Ron preview show as well. Yes, it's it's um it's very exciting but also very sad at the same time. Spring Sports Preview Show is my very first preview show. It's where I met like all of you guys and where I, I made really good friends. So it's very near and dear to my heart, but I'm so glad to be watching Kayla shine as producer this year. She's producing two of these shows two weeks in a row, so just give her a little round of applause there. But let's get into this uh, women's soccer team a little bit. Um, they had a crazy season last season, if you just want to go through that. Yeah, a great year last year, 16-4-2, and two, undefeated in conference, seven wins and two draws. So technically undefeated as there was no losses. Eliza, last year, our radio station, they started the year 2-2 two and two with losses to number 6 Penn State and then a 2-1 to one loss to Brown. And the whole station was a buzz saying, you know, this team, they might not have the sauce anymore. And after that, you know, they beat Fordham, lose to 21 Rutgers. And after that, started one of the biggest tears in the nation. They went undefeated from there on out, losing only to number one Stanford, the eventual NCAA tournament champions. A CAA title win in the process as well, and one of the most iconic goals in Hofstra sports history as well when Sabrina Bryant scored against Loyola Chicago. It was definitely a, a good season when you when you kind of start out like that, a couple losses. It, it's not shocking. I wasn't as shocked as some people were to see those losses because it's a new season. You're getting your footing. You have some new freshmen. You had a new goalie stepping in, um, just kind of learning the game, learning how to play as a team. And they got that rhythm, and it clicked, and they just went for it. Um, so those those two losses aren't shocking, and the, and it, clearly it ended up playing in their favor at the end. It did, and you look at where the players stood at the end of the year. Just to n give you a couple award wins, attacking player of the year, Sabrina Bryan. This is all within the CAA, by the way. Coach of the Year, Simon Ridia. Rookie of the Year, Anya Sutner. Defensive Player of the Year, Anya Sutner. Midfield of the Year, Lucy Porter. In six possible award categories, Hofstra had a winner in five of them, not winning Goalie of the Year. That went to Sidney Schneider of UNCW. This team is dominant from top to bottom, senior to freshman. I mean, there is not a more complete team on campus, and this is the most complete team I think I've ever seen in my time covering Hofstra sports. Definitely. Just their their goalie situation to begin with was the big talk of the town. What were they going to do? They were they going to do the two goalie situation again? But freshman Skylar Kuzmich comes in and just takes control of this team and becomes the dominant goaltender. She had four shutouts this, this past season. It was incredible for a freshman performance. So it's going to be like amazing to see what she, if she can repeat that, but even maybe step it up and do even better. Yeah, I think that's going to be a big storyline, and we'll get into that a little bit later with what to expect for the season. But another big thing we have to talk about from last season was the continued offensive presence of Lucy Porter and Sabrina Bryan. 16 goals and 11 goals apiece, 40 points and 32 points apiece as well. They are the one-two punch for this women's soccer team. Lucy Porter getting ready to play abroad in England in the Championship League. Sabrina Bryan entered this year's National Women's Soccer League draft, did not get drafted. But these two have a bright future, and last season just showed how bright of a future it is with these two attacking, even though they're entering their senior year. Is Sabrina Bryan climbing the the stat sheet, not just in the season, but in Hofstra record all time. She had 26 career goals for the Pride, which she was tied 8th for in program history, and she also moved into 7th all-time in points with 68. So she's just climbing the record sheet um, for this Hofstra, this Hofstra team. She is, and... You talk about Sabrina Bryan, I think we need to focus on it a bit more. We glossed over it. The Loyola-Chicago game, the first ever home NCAA tournament game in Hofstra history, the one nothing overtime win. That Sabrina Bryan goal, I think you could easily call the most iconic moment For sure. in Hofstra sports history. 100%. The goal, <laughs> the shot, the photo, you name it, she had it in that moment. It was just, it was a, such a cool moment. Just, they battled through that whole game, getting to the overtime and, and winning at home especially was, is just so special. And, and being able to win three years in a row, um, Matt, so you have a stat about that, winning four four games, four CAA championship titles, um, if you want to go with that. Yes, so Hofstra has won now three straight titles. If they win a title this year, that's four straight. Only one team in CAA history has won more titles in a row. That was William & Mary from 1996 to 2001. They won six straight titles. No other team has even won three in a row, and that was Hofstra. And those William & Mary teams coached by Coach John Daly 
They were dominant, but they only ever won their games by one or two goals. Hofstra against JMU in the CAA championship won 5-1, to one, setting the record for biggest margin of victory with four goals, and also most goals scored by a team in the championship with five in of the game. This team is offensively, defensively dominant with Anya Suttner continuing to grow. This team just showed us the sky was the limit last season. Yeah, and this is going to be the big storyline for this season is if they can win another CAA championship and make it four. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. But first, we are going to go to a sports update with Max Underhill. <laughs> This is Maxwell Underhill with your WRHU Sports Update. The New York Islanders return to the ice tomorrow night in western New York when they take on the Buffalo Sabres. The Isles look to build on their momentum after a Saturday night victory over the East Division leading Boston Bruins. You can catch all the action live starting at 6.30 here on the New York Islanders radio network. On the collegiate hardwood, Hofstra Pride men's basketball dropped their second straight game in a weekend series with James Madison on Sunday. The Dukes' Vado Morse notched 16 points to vault James Madison into first place in the CAA standings. Hofstra's Jalen Ray poured in 25 for the Pride, but it wasn't enough as Coach Fairley's group fell 74-70. In the Big Ten, number three Michigan dropped number 21 Wisconsin 67-59, and Nebraska found their first conference victory today over Penn State 62-61. In the Big East, Seton Hall defeated Marquette 57-51, in the ACC, Georgia Tech cruised past Pittsburgh 71-65 and Notre Dame knocked off Miami 71-61. In the Missouri Valley Conference, the Drake Bulldogs edged out number 22 Loyola Chicago in OT 51-50. To the games currently in action, Maryland leads Minnesota 44-28 at halftime and out west in the Pac-12, Arizona State leads Oregon State 41-31 at halftime. With your WRHU sports update, I'm Maxwell Underhill. Welcome back to the Women's Soccer Half Hour here of the Fall Sports Preview Show in the spring, if you want to call it that, as its long title. <laughs> I'm Max Sacco, joined by Eliza Kravitz. Earlier this week, I was able to speak with Lucy Porter, senior midfielder for this Hofstra Pride women's soccer team, about what she expects in this very interesting upcoming, I guess you could call it 2020 season for the record books, and what's ahead. For 88.7 FM WRHU, I'm Max Sacco, joined by a senior midfielder and forward, the one, the only, Lucy Porter. Lucy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, first question, what was it like when the COVID pause hit and that now you don't have a fall season, it's been a very long time since you've been on the pitch again. Take me through kind of what your preparation has been since the pause, now entering your season. I mean, it was really tough going through a break and not really knowing what's happening with training and everything was all up in the air. And then obviously having the season cancelled in fall, it, it was tough to get like the team motivated and, and to get through that period. But luckily, we've got such great staff and we've got programmes put together and we feel so prepared for this season, despite all the circumstances. I feel like it's shown char the character of the team um, in how we are now prepared for this coming season after everything that's gone that's happened. And now, talking a bit more about the team, this is a team with, I think, a senior class that you could easily say is maybe the greatest of all time to walk through Hoff, Plum, and Sucker. Is it a different mentality, kind of knowing this is the last ride, you know, for you guys, for a lot of the seniors after this? Some of you are going professional like you have back in England. I know Sabrina Bryan entered the draft this year for the National Women's Soccer League in America. What's kind of the mentality? For me personally, this, this one means the most to me. And I think a lot of the girls, the seniors would agree. Um, you want to go out on a high. You don't want to go out after the, the three seasons we've had previously to, to then not do as well. Yeah, th this one means the most and is definitely um, what, is, what is firing us up. And now looking a bit more at the team, looking with some of the opponents, are there any matches you guys, both maybe in the non-conference schedule and then also in the conference schedule that you guys are circling and kind of getting a bit more prepared? You know, oh, that's going to be a big matchup. What matchups kind of have that circle around it? 
Honestly, I feel like in the CAAs, uh, in the season, every single game is as tough. You can't underestimate. And you you don't know uh, the new players coming in, the dynamics of the squad, especially with COVID and, and what's happened. It's really, you just got to take it as it comes. But for me personally, I think Stony Brook is a big game. I'm excited for that. Obviously, it's a battle um, of Long Island and that you love a good derby. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking a bit more just about the season ahead, the CAA changed it. We're now it's just a North division and a South division. How much does that affect your training where maybe you're not going to see teams like a William and Mary or a JMU all the time. And you're going to see teams in the North more like Northeastern a lot more than you would have in a previous season. I mean, we've just got to take it as it comes and all the teams in our conference are of the, of the same high quality. So it's, it's just, fires that to want to go and to the CA championships and then beat the teams that we've not been able to beat hopefully in our little conference and then for the team this year last year you got to the NCAA tournament made a very deep run got your first ever home win against Loyola Chicago what would you say is really the goals this year in regards to making it to the NCAA tournament what comes next then after at least qualifying for the tournament I say we want to go one round further than we did last year. Um, since it's my senior year, I want to go out on a on a high, and there would it would be mean well to get to the third round. And who are you guys at least looking at it when it comes to getting the third round? What is the team really emphasizing this year that maybe you haven't emphasized before? Maybe it's more offensive pressure. Maybe it's more you know push out from the back. What are some of the things you guys are emphasizing more this year compared to seasons prior? Work rate and the desire to win. I feel under not being able to train that much over the past year, the, what we can control in every game is how hard we work and what we're putting in. It takes 0% talent to, to get your all on the field. So that's what we're really going for this year. And now, obviously, every year you get a new set of freshmen to come in, a new set of first-year players to come into the team. How have they been acclimating to a season that's like no other where you don't have soccer in the fall, you obviously play in the spring now, you're at, you know, you have a huge senior class leaving. What's kind of been the acclimation like for some of the new players that you've noticed? I mean, a lot of the, the new players have come in and they are a really good class, probably one of the best we've had. And they, they've been pushing us all on to do better, myself included. Seeing that sort of competition coming into the squad, it just makes you want to work harder and, and do more to, to prove to Simon that we are all, that we want to start. And that's, that's the, um, the sort of ex external motivation that that's a lot of us have really taken on board. And now uh, one player, one of those freshmen last year who's now a sophomore this year, Skylar Kuzmich, really became the hero in net for you guys last season, taking the job as a true freshman. How important is she for you guys going forward this year? Oh, she's so important. She's vital. She's She's been training really well in preseason. We've had another freshman goalkeeper come in, which which motivated her to, to press on even higher than what she's been uh, playing in the in the past seasons so yeah she's gonna be a huge role for us in this coming season and now finally back to the seniors a bit before we get to our final couple of questions here beyond just you know we want to go out on a high we want to make sure we go out how have the seniors kind of acclimated to this is the last ride and also a bit as well you know not playing fall ball typically but now having to just get started right away in the spring I mean it's been a huge adjustment and not how we pictured our senior year to go but I think it's brought us all together as a class in a way and together we're really working for each other and we're, we're doing the extra sessions, we're, we're doing everything we really can to make this year our best year and just hopefully have as many memories as we can, positive memories. So before we wrap up, we always do a round of speed questions. These are just quick yes or no answers or <laughs> quick answer. These are, Gosh. These are the fun questions. All right. Favorite warm-up song? Ginger by Right On. <laughs> Interesting pick. All right. <laughs> what is your one, I guess, superstition you got to do before every match? Every football player always has one or two. Um, I always put on my right soccer boot first. What is your favorite football team? Wolverhampton Wanderers. What is your most memorable, memorable game you've ever played in? Um, winning the NCAA's first round at Hofstra. What is your most, most memorable goal? Freshman year, scoring the first goal in the CAA championship. And now this is the loaded question we always end on. Hofstra wins the CAA title this year and makes it to the NCAA tournament if... We all work hard and believe in ourselves. 
Once again, everyone, that was Lucy Porter, midfielder and forward for Hofstra women's soccer team. Lucy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucy Porter, for that interview. Now we're going to dive into a little bit of what's to come this season. Obviously, a big storyline we touched on before was can they win another CAA championship? Yes. But I think what's really important here is all of their superstar players that get goals, create assists, that do things for them are all seniors this year. So that's going to be interesting, especially moving forward, continuing to the season after. That is Lucy Shepard, Jordan Littleboy, Sabrina Bryan, Lucy Porter, Amanda Abesson, all five of those names, Eliza. If we were a professional sports team, I would have those numbers retired and those jerseys hanging in the rafters. I think that Bryan and, and Porter should have their numbers retired, period, but that's a different story for a different day. This is the last ride. Mm -hmm. You heard Lucy Porter say it. They want to go out on a win, and they don't want to just win. They want to shock the world, make it past the third round of the NCAA tournament. Hofstra's problem is when you're a mid-major school, you're put in usually as the eight or the nine seed, so your next match right afterwards is against the number one team that typically goes on to win the national championship. Mm -hmm. If there's a team that can make a deep run and shock the world, it's going to be this one. Oh, I have no doubt about it. They they all want it. They haven't played in so long, so they want it even more because they they got it taken away from them um, this past season. So they they want to come back. They want to they want to win it for themselves. They want to win it for the seniors, um, and they just they just want to win. And you can see that in, in the Lucy Porter interview. She said they think it's brought them closer together. They've been putting in that extra work for each other. So I really think this team is going to come out and be even better than they were last year. But I think a question we have to talk about now when you look at this team, you obviously have your senior class. There's five of them. All five of them really are forward attacking core with Shepard and Brian. Abesson always comes off the bench as really an enforcer role, being very mm -hmm. physical and an uh, energizer bunny. And you have Porter little, and Little Boy who really man the midfield. Do you think it's a possibility this year maybe we see some different players looking down the line? Allison Mendez, maybe Caroline Nuttall. Even Marlene Freese a bit more. She had a very short and freshman year due to injury, but now she'll be coming back. Do you think this is the season maybe we see the seniors play a little bit less and the bench come out a bit more to prepare them for next year? Yeah, and that's going to be the tricky thing with this season for Coach Simon Ridioff is, is making those decisions because obviously if they don't play those younger players that don't get as much field time and don't get as much time off the bench, they're not going to be as prepared to step up and, and step into these big shoes that they have to fill for next season. So it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth. And definitely in those games, those non-conference games before um, they start at the beginning of the season, they're going to want to try to get those younger players in there um, to, to get more experience and to, to, to gain um some knowledge but also being on the bench being able to watch those seniors play you get that experience and you can can watch and learn from just sitting on the bench but they're going to need that that playing time as well well i think something before we move on from the roster here bella richards no longer with the team she did graduate from Hofstra university a semester early the new zealand native mm -hmm. that's a huge role to fill in the midfield she was maybe not statistically the best but more of the emotional guide the team make sure everyone's playing i guess the mom if you want to call it of the team <laughs> Who do you pick to fill that role? It's it's going to be tricky. She played a lot of offense. She played a lot of defense. Um, she she played the whole field. So you're going to have to find a player that can play the whole field. If you try to put a player in there that is more defensive or more offensive, you're going to still lack um, that that presence that she she had on there. So so it it's going to be it's going to be a toss up. I can't pick exactly one person. So it's going to be whoever can can play the field the most and who can ever. Um, cover all the bases that Bella Richards was able to cover. You know, you make a great point. We don't know who it's going to be. Last year, we didn't know that we are going to be starting a true freshman in that. We thought we were exactly. going to be running the cycle. But if I had to make an early prediction, I'm taking Ellen Halseth. The very under-the-radar transfer from Florida International was the second-leading player on the team with nine points, four goals, and adding one assist from Bextua, Norway. You have an already NCAA seasoned experienced player. She's only a sophomore. She's a forward so simply put, to adjust the formation, you let Lucy Porter sink back a bit instead of playing that forward role with Sabrina Bryan. Let her sink into the at mm -hmm. attacking mid to shuttle the ball forward. And I think you start maybe with this player. I mean, obviously, again, we don't know what can happen. Last year we had a curveball thrown at us with Kuzmich, but yeah. I think Ellen Hasseth 
is that player to go into the mix? That's a good prediction. But I also, also like we were talking about Skylar Kuzmich, there could be a freshman that comes in. That's true. And is a superstar player. She played really good in high school, um, playing the whole field, and, and can cover that um, Bella Richards position. And, and we just don't know that yet because we haven't been able to see them play. So the, the first couple of games are going to be telling for sure about this team. It will be. It will be. But... These first couple games are also great test games. You open up the season in six days and 14 hours and counting now against Stony Brook at home. Then it's Fordham on the road, and then it's Fairleigh Dickinson, and you, Albany, to round out your first four games of non-conference. Eliza, I'm going to be honest. Looking at conference and non-conference, and there is a rogue non-conference game against Adelphi on April 2nd, I think, just to tune the team up and <laughs> maybe get some of the bench players some action. I think this team is going to go undefeated, and not just undefeated, but no ties undefeated, only wins from here on out. I think that's a bold statement. I think I think it could happen. Um, but you never really truly know, especially with all the new freshmen, all the new incoming people, and like we talked about, trying to get more of the bench on the field. Um, but I think it's definitely doable. This team is, is unbelievable. Um, and if they can come out and be the same team that they were last year and be better, I think it's definitely doable. Um, it's just... With everything that happened with COVID, with the season being canceled last semester and everything being so up in the air and so unable to be normal and being able to practice normally, you don't know which players have been able to put in extra work at home, have been able to go to uh, private areas to practice. So some of these teams that like North Northeastern could come and be really, really good and be Un, like sneaky good and we just don't know it because their players put in the time and effort off the off the clock so it's going to be interesting it's going to be a really interesting season and that's true because this year there is the split in the divisions of north and south division so we mm -hmm. won't see jmu william and mary elon typically teams that have kind of been a thorn in our side at times instead yep. we're only going to see drexel northeastern delaware in a rogue match against Towson. But these are winnable matches. These are mm -hmm. not matches I'm, I can't even say I'm worried about. These are winnable matches. I could see Hofstra coming away. Only Northeastern's the match that I'm a little nervous about. Yeah, they definitely are. I, I try not to be too certain with these things because you <laughs> never know what can happen. But I definitely think that they it's in their favor. Um, so They have all the right tools. They just got to go out there and do what they know how to do best, and that's win. And, hey, we can talk about these other teams all we want, but Joe Viglucci, Olivia Bevanetto, Christian Lenoir, and David Blixover took us beyond the pride to see what else is happening around the CAA. After a year and a half hiatus from in-game action, the Hofstra Pride women's soccer team are back on the field. The Pride are eager to get back where they left off as Hofstra capped off their season with a CAA championship victory over James Madison. Following a 5-1 victory in the title match, Hofstra became the first CAA program to win three straight championships since William and Mary in 1996. Final 10 seconds now here at Hofstra Soccer Stadium. Pass comes into the center, a shot from distance is wide, but it won't matter. Hofstra, their third straight CAA championship, a 5-1 victory over James Madison to win their sixth ever CAA title. What a story for the Pride, three straight, and doing so in dominating fashion here on their home field. Sound courtesy to the CAA. The CAA women's soccer title was the sixth in Hofstra's team history. Head coach Simon Ridioff reports on this victory, noting that the energy and effort his team displayed was key for their championship win. During this game, Hofstra outshot James Madison at 15-5 and put seven shots on goal. Anja Sutner and Lucy Porter were two key players during this game as Sutner brought a short cross in from the right and Porter found the back of the net from the six yard box, scoring the first goal within the first three minutes of the game. Edge of the area will be kept alive by Hofstra. They set another cross back in and a flick at the near post is in the back of the net. An early strike for the Pride coming off the set piece, the second ball delivered back in by Hofstra. And as they so often do, Ryan, they strike early in this one, a one to nothing lead here in the fourth minute. Sound courtesy to the CAA. Porter tied for eighth most goals in the country, giving herself 16 scores on the season. Porter, alongside teammates Sabrina Bryan, Jordan Littleboy, and Bella Richards, were named to the All-CAA tournament team for their performance. This is just one of the many highlights of the Pride's historic 2019 season. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, 
The women's soccer team has not played a game since their championship season, and the players are eager to get back onto the field and build off their performance last year. Following their CAA championship win, Hofstra hosted an NCAA playoff match where Sabrina Bryan drilled a goal to seal a tight overtime victory for the Pride. Now the Hofstra Pride control it, now an attack here, as now it's moved to Bryan, Bryan has the space, Bryan in the box, Bryan takes the shot and finds the corner and scores! Bryan scores and sends the Hofstra Pride to the second round of the NCAA Women's Soccer Championship Tournament! They fell short in the next round to Stanford, who eventually went on to win the championship. Hofstra made it to the second round for two consecutive years and will be looking to continue their winning ways. The Pride should be feeling confident heading into the season as they were named number 23 in top drawer soccer preseason rankings. Lucy Porter was also named to the NCAA preseason best third team. With that being said, Hofstra has kept all of their key players and are looking to make it four straight CAA titles. The Pride hope to remain nationally recognized and do so by progressing even further in the playoffs. For WRHU Sports, I'm Joe Viglucci. Thank you very much again to Joe Viglucci, Olivia Bevanetto, Christian Unlaw, and David Blixover for the wonderful take around the CAA. Before we go, Eliza, I think we need to say our wonderful, I think, I think easily the greatest beat reporter. fantastic beat reporter. He gave great reports on our women's soccer team, Jordan Stupler. He is tuning in from Montreal. He loves this team so much, and he is so excited to see this team win another CAA championship. Eliza, before we go, we'll keep it short. Before we throw, we got... We have enough time. We have 20 seconds. Okay. Quick and short. Hofstra wins the CAA if. If they play as a team. It's a team effort. Their defense, their offense, and their goaltending have to be in sync. But I have no doubt about it that it will be. And I think that's where we're going to end it. Once again, everyone, thank you for tuning in to the Women's Soccer Hour of the Locker Room preview show for fall sports here on the Hofstra Alternative web channel. Stay tuned for men's soccer. We got some thank yous to go around. Taking us for the excellent take around the CAA with Beyond the Pride was Joe Viglucci, Olivia Bevanetto, Christian Lanois, and David Blixilver. Giving us terrific updates about sports around the world was Max Underhill and our uh, enigmatic engineer, Mike Corson, was pushing all the right buttons around the board today. And for one final time in her last ever preview show, the amazing, wonderful Eliza Kravitz, my wonderful co-host, did a great job today. And I'm Max Sacco saying thank you and have a great rest of your night, everyone. Welcome inside the Hofstra Pride men's soccer portion of the locker room spring edition of the 2020 fall sports preview show here on the Hofstra Alternative web channel, which you can find on WRHU.org and the WRHU app. I'm Andrew Merdolo. Alongside me is the whiz of the pitch, Ryan Ginio. Before we begin, we'd like to let you know that both on Twitter and Instagram, you can follow WRHU Sports for our latest coverage of Hofstra Pride Sports. Ryan. Prior to Friday, it had been exactly 460 days since the Hofstra Pride men's soccer team last took the pitch, but Friday they were finally able to get their season underway. Yep, uh, they played against Syracuse, you know, an ACC team in a very big conference. They're actually in the NCAA tournament last season, and they actually had some experience as well earlier this season, but we'll get to that game. But right now, let's talk about last season with the Pride finishing 10-6-1, a 5-2-1 record in the CAA. That was good enough for third place. They did end with the same record as James Madison, but they lost 
uh, in the regular season to them. So that decided the tiebreaker. From there, they would go on to the semifinals to lose to James Madison on penalties, which, again, we'll get to later on. Yeah, in fact, we'll just dive right back into that 2019 season right now, Ryan. And when you look at the way it unfolded, first of all, Pride coming off a 2018 season where, of course, they fall in PKs to James Madison in the CAA championship game. And it's a tough way to go out with the Hofstra Pride the next year, full of promise, full of hope. And Ryan, you knew they were ready to start proving the world wrong, get some revenge. They opened the season, pair of wins followed by a pair of losses, winning loss back and forth until finally they dropped two more right before conference play really begins to open up. Of course, one of those games being against conference for UNCW, the other one against the University at Albany, tough three-goal loss there. But then things started to change for this team, Ryan. Yep, they won on a six-game un beaten run to end the regular season. Uh, just absolutely you know, amazing. He had these big wins against Delaware, you know, 5-0. He had Matthew Vowinkle score a hat-trick. But the real key during this run was really defense. They conceded just four goals during that stretch, keeping cl uh, three clean sheets, and they managed to do so without Sean Nealis at the back, who graduated the season prior and ended up getting drafted by the New York Red Bulls. That's a major loss of the back, but they managed to cope with it. Yeah, and a big part of that was a guy like Alex Ashton Ryan, who throughout his career with the Hofstra Pride and just continued to be consistently solid for this team. Up with 26 career clean sheets for this specific goalkeeper. And let me tell you something. He was out there doing the same thing as usual. A couple more clean sheets on the board. One goal matches, maybe even two here or there. But Alex Ashton was a stalwart between the pipes. And during that run, it wasn't like he didn't have work to do. Against Drexel, that, the game that started off the unbeaten run, he made a season-high seven saves to really keep the pride in the game and help them come away with a very hard-earned point, again, to start that unbeaten run. And then against Binghamton, another draw, five saves. So he was absolutely... Uh, it really had a great master class in between the sticks. And Ryan, like you said, seven match unbeaten streak. It even bled into the CAA tournament. That first round matchup against Delaware, they take two to one. And Ryan, again, when we talk about defense, you have to give credit to that back line for the Hofstra Pride. You'll get veterans, guys like Giorgio Malley who sit back there, even Leonard Soifert. And then you look at some of the newer players, some of the freshmen that joined in last year, guys like Stone Strong and Frederick Reaper. They played major roles, especially a guy like Frederick Reaper, who similarly to George O'Malley is a guy that was known to come up make some plays offensively as well as defensively and with a great back line that just makes more room for both the midfield and attack to really flourish and one guy that really flourished last season was Matthew Vowinkle leading the team in goals and points he was second in the CAA in goals with 13 named to the all CAA first team he had a couple hat tricks and he had some clutch goals as well, including in the CAA quarterfinals against Delaware with just under five minutes to go. It was a nice, simple through ball to the striker provided by Hendrik Hebeker. You know, it's those type of runs that break through that back line that really encapsulates what Vo Winkle is all about. So much of what a striker does is about positioning. It's a very strong element of Vo Winkle's game. And it's what separates him from the rest of the crop among the CAA's finest forwards. And Ryan, what's even more impressive about the run this player goes on how about five, first five matches, no goals for Matthew Vowinkle. Then gets one, two against Elon Marist, another game without a goal, and then all of a sudden, as time goes on, you look at this seven-game stretch, Ryan, Matthew Vowinkle explodes. I'm talking about matches where you see hat trick followed up by a pair of goals followed by another hat trick take a break in between no goals against columbia on senior day and ca tournament he's right back at it with that major goal against delaware so you look at a guy like him he's a guy that yes we've seen him start slow before but when he gets on he might be one of the most dominant players in the nation. I'm not just talking about CAA. I'm talking about the nation as a lethal goal scorer. And it's that type of national presence that got him drafted very recently to FC Cincinnati in the third round of the MLS Super Draft. He had Sean Neal was drafted by the Red Bulls a couple seasons ago, so he is joining very elite company uh, with now FC Cincinnati. And just a couple more players you got to mention here, Ryan, because there were a lot of, of up-and-coming players on this team a season ago. You want to talk about a senior that is now coming on, a guy like Oscar Ramsey, who early in his career looked promising for the Hofstra Pride, had a couple injuries here and there that kept him out of the lineup and kept him on the sideline for a season or so. But he bounced back in a big way just a season ago and was able to really start getting back into that scoring mix for the Hofstra Pride. Ends up getting four points all off of assists. Doesn't exactly score the goals, but he was able to dish it out, help his teammates open up sp some space. But 
Ryan Hendrick Hebeker is a guy I really want to detail. He scored some clutch goals for this team down the stretch and was able to help them get some big victories along the way. Now he's absolutely unreal again on this wing, really just making a nice dynamic partnership with Matthew Vowinkle. I mean, no striker is complete without its support, and Hebeker just provides that cutting edge. Um, his his on-the-ball skill is absolutely brilliant. I mean, it, just, it seems like the balls attack him at, at times. But another guy you also have to mention, going back to the midfield, uh, was Petter Solberg, really making this midfield very versatile. Uh, hailing from Sweden, he actually came over from South Carolina. Got valuable experience playing in those big games, you know, against you know second-ranked Wake Forest, for example. But again, and again, completing one of the most dynamic midfields in the CAA. He added really a more attacking and clinical threat. Yeah, this Second on the team, is, you know, six goals, had two assists as well. Yeah, Ryan, this may be one of the more versatile, if not the most versatile midfield in the Colonial Athletic Association. I can't think of anyone better, knowing the way Richard Nuttall likes to play some of these midfielders, rotate them in and out, up front, back on the defensive end, it all works. But Ryan, the sad part to the season is, of course, CAA semifinals. It's James Madison all over again after losing to them in the championship the year before. And this time a heartbreaker in penalty kicks causing them to fall two to one in the match overall yeah it was just deja vu just like the 2018 final 1-1 in regulation past the extra time you go to penalties it's really a tough one to take for the pride they fought hard once again against one of the top teams in the CAA and even if they got one more point in the regular season got the second seed over JMU they likely still would have played them in the semi so there is no avoiding the Dukes and I think this season they'll be so so hungry uh, to get revenge on them yeah, a pair of first half goals both teams playing some solid defense on the back end but in the end, it was James Madison with the big penalty kicks late. And that will, of course, break. Well, we got a lot more to talk about, including our future interview with head coach Richard Nuttall. But first, we have a sports update with our own Tim Crowley. <laughs> Your WRG sports update, I'm Tim Crowley. The New York Islanders are off tonight, following a 4-2 win over the Boston Bruins last night. The Islanders are back in action tomorrow night in Buffalo for an in-state matchup against the Sabres. Puck Drop is set for 7 p.m. You can catch all of the action right here on 88.7 FM WRHU and all across the New York Islanders radio network. In Hofstra sports, one team was in action this afternoon. In Harrisonburg, Virginia, the Hofstra Pride men's basketball team visited the James Madison Dukes for the second game of a weekend series. The Dukes outlasted the Pride by a final score of 74-70. Jalen Ray led the way for the Pride, tallying 25 points. Elsewhere in the CAA, two more games on the schedule went final this afternoon. In Maryland, Towson took on Northeastern, with the Tigers defeating the Huskies 68-57 at SECU Arena. In a battle for the Carolinas, the Elon Phoenix headed south for a matchup with the Charleston Cougars. The Phoenix emerged victorious from this one with a 66-55 road win. To the women's CAA, two games rounded out weekend play. In Boston, the ninth place Northeastern Huskies defeated the second place Towson Tigers by a final score of 72-62. Finally, from Beantown to Philly, Two of the conference's top teams faced off with the Delaware Fighting Blue Hens visiting the Drexel Dragons as the Blue Hens took home a 66-55 victory. With your WRHU Sports Update, I'm Tim Crowley. And we are back here inside the Hofstra men's soccer portion of the locker room spring 2021 edition of the fall sports preview show here on the Hofstra Alternative web channel. Andrew Merdolo here alongside Ryan Janio. A big thanks to Tim for that trip around the sports world. But now we have a special treat here. Just a few days ago, Ryan and I got to speak with Hofstra Pride so men's head soccer coach Richard Nuttall about the season to come and the grind that it's been to take the pitch again. Andrew Rodolo and Ryan Genio here on 88.7 FM WRHU, the Locker Room Spring Sports Preview Show Extended Edition. Here we are talking with Hofstra men's soccer coach Richard Nuttall. Days and moments before the new season kicks off, Coach, it's been a long, grueling offseason. How excited are you to get back on the pitch with this oh, team? It's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, with all the testing that you have to do and everything, getting the preparation, the new stuff on the bus, everything you got to do, it's... It's a lot, but I'm just so happy. I can't wait to get on the field and get coaching. And more than ever, as we spoke before the programme started, I'm just so happy for the players that they get to put their hard work, their talent and you know their enthusiasm into a, into a new season. So I'm just really happy 
ecstatic to be honest and uh, excited for the new season I'm just happy for the players uh, above all else and uh, I'm thankful this university and, and our athletic department and the hierarchy here and all everybody involved have gone through uh, so many trials and tribulations to get us to this point. I'm just um, hopeful that we manage to play tomorrow and uh, it'll be a, a, a wonderful thing. Now, I know it's felt like ages ago. You guys haven't played a competitive match since last November, but what was your overall assessment of last season? By the second half of the season, I thought we could have beaten anybody in the country. And, uh, we, you know, if you look at our results and our, even... JMU we lost to in the semi-final on penalties we were by look the year before they were the best team and we lost some penalties in the final but in the semi-final uh, final last year to lose how we did I just thought we were very very unfortunate we just didn't finish and uh, we we're the best team so I thought we were the best team in the conference by the end of the year in my opinion and we'd come together we were tough to beat and we didn't go, give up many shots on goal and we, I think we're in the top 10 in the country for scoring so I was proud of who we are and who we were and where we got to and uh, you know but it means nothing now it's a new season and coach you talked about how down the stretch I mean we look at it here six straight matches did not lose as well as three games with clean sheets coming from your goaltenders, goalkeepers. Mm -hmm. How And you even look offensively, you talked about offense. A guy like Matthew Vowinkle, key contributor on the attack, gets drafted to the, in the MLS Super Draft this past year. Can you talk to me about how he kind of led the way that season and also what he does kind of on and off the pitch as a leader? We've been around Matt a long time because we were his club coaches as well. And uh, we've known him since the uh, Believe it or not, a little, a little boy, six or seven or eight years old, and he's been part of uh, our lives. So, and he's, uh, I don't think in all that time we've ever had one problem with him in terms of his character and, and how, he, how he is as a person. And, uh, you know, he works, he doesn't say a lot, he just works, he, he listens, he gets on with his job, and he's a consummate professional in that respect. He just wants to do well and wants to get better. Uh, from the point of view of, of his abilities, I believe in the box is as good as any college player in the country. And of course, you, you've got to have um, uh, comparable abilities that will help him in the box. You know, players, wingers that will get crossed and people that will supply, supply chances to him. But when in the box, as I say, two-footed, good in the air, brave, and uh, as good as anybody in the country. So I'm proud of who he is, what, he, what he's achieved, and hopefully what he can achieve. How about some of the other freshmen newly recruited to this team? What are your first impressions of them? Because I know you haven't had a lot of time to see them play competitively. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk as a group here. Look, it's been it's been a great group. There's eight or nine of them who are outstanding, and you know, three or four that will hopefully come on in time. But you know, and and on top of that, there's two or three who are going to be on the field as starters tomorrow. So I think that shows what we think of them. You know, a couple have got injuries, you know. Um, Jack O'Malley's unfortunately just had a, a hip operation and Olga Malo is going to have a shoulder operation next week or so. So that's been a bit tough for those guys as freshmen. But the other guys, Wessel and Ryan and Rock and Pierce and all that are all, all in the mix, you know, and uh, we're, we're thankful for that. So from that point of view, I think it's been a successful year. But, you know, I'll probably be able to tell you more by the end of the season, <laughs> see how they've done and how they adapt. You know, we've had no scrimmages, so... We've just seen them in practice and as everyone knows from practice to games, look, against teams like oh, we're playing tomorrow, it's just a, a massive difference. So, But their mentality is good. Their effort's been incredible and I've got to give kudos to all our upperclassmen who are, who are welcoming it, but real, you know, they, they'll let them know when they're not doing the right things, but they're great role models. So it's been a, a good 14, 15 days of, of practice so far. With COVID-19 moving over college athletics for this past you know year or so, what is it like for not only the players, but for even the coaching staff as well to step into this new world of protocols? It's, it's different, isn't it? It's so different. But, you know, you've just got to keep thinking all the time because what was the norm that you'd lax into a regular cycle with? You've got to, you're not in that same cycle and you've just got to be aware and alive and, you know, wearing your mask to you know, washing your hands to all the protocols that are in place. It's just very different. And uh, we've just got to, as a group, as a family, we've got to keep reminding uh, each other of the behaviours. Uh, we've got to do the, the protocols and you've just got to make the best of it. And um, 
there's a rule. We don't, we don't allow anybody to complain. It is what it is, and we'll do it to the best of our ability, and we're going to represent to the best of our ability. So let's get on with it. It's the new norm. Just let's get stuck into it. You talk about some of the new norms. Of course, another thing that changed this season is the traveling. There's no long bus trips this year down to Virginia to play JMU or William & Mary, even Charleston or Elon, UNCW. You don't have to go down the East Coast to do that anymore. You're kind of stuck between Massachusetts and Delaware. What are the pros and cons of having a schedule with so many teams close by? I mean, you're not away from home as much with your family situation, but I mean, it's just a privilege whether you're going on a 10 hour bus, uh, you know, eight hour bus ride or a, a flight or a, a one hour bus ride. It's just a privilege to represent your university and the joy of the game doesn't change, you know, just a little bit of, of how you. Um, you are, and, and, and the situation within, you know, everybody on the bench, there's a mass, so and so, so no, but nothing, the actual excitement of the game doesn't change. And being around um, a group of young men who are, when we're travelling, it keeps you young, and, and, you know, they've got their own ways of doing things, which are very different to when my time, but I just feel as um, I'm blessed. I've got a brilliant coaching staff, and we've got a great group, group of young men who are doing brilliant in the classroom. You know, we, we, we're close to a 3 7 average as a team, which I'm proud of. And it's just a joy. And it's going to be even more of a joy when we hopefully play the game tomorrow. I'll be a bit emotional, to be honest. Uh, it's been such, such, such a long time since the last game. And finally, Coach, your last question here. It's a quick fill in the blank we always like to ask. Hofstra will win the CAA this spring if... We stay injury-free, which we haven't done a good a good job of so far. And and our players, our special players, play anywhere near how they can play. We've got special players. And I think the last thing is we come together collectively, defensively. I think those are the the three main points for me. You know, it's sort of a new defensive side uh, so from that point of view, we've got we've got the potential. I hate that word potential, but uh, we can do some damage. All right, Coach, thank you so much for all your time here today, and good luck out there with the new season beginning just right around the corner. And that was uh, Hofstra Men's Soccer head coach Richard Nuttall. Andrew, what were your takeaway from this interview? Well, Coach is really excited for the season to come, Ryan. And, I mean, you hear all the stuff he's talking about with all the – the precautions and the testing and everything. He has to finally get his team back. He's ready to finally get them back into a competitive spirit here. And for this team, you know, it's it's been quite a long time. But, Ryan, you know they're going to get back on the pitch. You know they want to go ahead and get revenge from that tough loss to James Madison that we mentioned in the CAA semifinals a season ago. So we're going to look to see what happens there. But in terms of the new season to come, you know what, Ryan, let's start, let's start diving into it a little bit here. And... It's a strange season coming up because you look at it, not a lot of matches on the schedule that you're used to, only 11 coming up. But the better thing is not a lot of travel this season. Hofstra doesn't go any farther south than Delaware and doesn't go any farther north than Massachusetts. So for the Pride, not a lot of long bus trips, but kicked off their season this past Friday, Ryan, up in Syracuse against the Syracuse Orange of the ACC. And Ryan, it was it was a tough outcome for the Hofstra Pride. I think this is really... This may be their toughest matchup of the season in terms of who they face opponent-wise. We t I mentioned earlier in the show how Syracuse has faced, you know, they're in a great conference in the ACC. They're in the a a NCAA tournament, and they really stuck in there. You know, they conceded in the first half, but they managed to level it up through a freshman, Ryan Carmichael, who hails from Northern Ireland. So he is already off the mark in just his first game. They did concede a late goal with a few minutes to go. So, again, tough one to take, but... You can really build off this start, and especially you know, incorporating all these freshmen. And they actually had a freshman in between the sticks uh, in Wessel Spiel, uh, hailing from the Netherlands. So it looks like he's going to be the starting goalkeeper for now. Yeah, at the moment, he looks to be the number one. Again, we'll see what happens as the season goes on. A lot of different options to choose from for Richard Nuttall. But you talk about the pride starting freshman, Ryan. They started three including Spiel and Carmichael. But at the same time, they also threw another two into the match later on, and guys like Sam Eccles, Rock Carls as well. And you look at just the way the Pride are kind of bringing in freshmen, and you, you hear Coach Richard Nuttall in our interview saying, you know, we just got to make sure the team stays healthy, which is something they've struggled to do so far. Well, when you look at this lineup, you see a guy like Stone Strong is not in there, and you realize, okay, maybe injuries are starting to bite him early on. You hope they can recover from that. But in terms of the way this match went, Ryan, I think this was a solid opening to your season. Because when you look at it, 
if you get a freshman scoring to open the season, that's fantastic. Now, the rest of the guys you'd like to think, you know, chemistry is going to be getting in there. you got to get that chemistry locked in. They want to get it back from the last time they were on the pitch, which, again, 460 days prior. It's a lot of time to have to get back in terms of correlation and chemistry. But they did a good job just being able to kind of piece it all together and put out a solid performance, again, only giving up three shots on goal to their goalkeeper in Spiel. And we talk about these freshmen coming in, and they have to replace you know, quite a few guys leaving the program. We already talked about Alex Askin leaving. Also, Adam Saville, um, who got two goals and was second on the team in assists despite playing in defense. He also came up close with a couple of game winners. Um, and also Oscar Ramsey, they lose him, the New Zealand native, who was an all-CAA third-team selection. He got four assists on the season. He stayed in the States after signing a professional contract with USL Championship side Charlotte Independence last January. But those are three guys, along with Petter Solberg, uh, it's that you know, you got to replace, and uh, these freshmen really have to step up and take control. Yeah, you talk about guy, a guy like Petter Solberg and even a guy like Frederick Reef, we can kind of go into them a little bit, but a guy like Solberg takes away from what really was, I think, one of the, if not the most deep CA, or not maybe the best set up sort of midfield in the CAA again Peter Solberg guy was really kind of gritty was able to get some big goals but make some big defensive stops in terms of the other team bringing it up but a guy like Frederick Reaper is huge because he's a guy who was very very tall 6'5 and as a defenseman or as a defender rather they like to drop him in the box and say hey listen just kind of tilt your head towards the goal and if you can get the header in that's huge for us off a corner kick but for him, for those two, it's tough to lose. And then Alex Ashton, a guy, again, as we mentioned, 26 career clean sheets over four seasons with this Hofstra Pride team. It's hard to lose stability like that in between the pipes. But again, we're going to see what they work with their goalkeeping situation for this season. And Ryan, we talk about the season. Let's start getting into some crucial dates that I kind of want to highlight on this schedule going forward. First of all, next Hofstra Pride match is their first home match of the season here in Hempstead when they take on Fairleigh Dickinson February 19th. That will be this Friday, just the five days away. Now, a couple other interesting ones I want to note here. Their Long Island rivalry against Stony Brook right here in Hempstead, Friday, February 26th. UMass, I think this may be their next hardest game coming up on their schedule. UMass on the road in Amherst, Wednesday, March 3rd. Then they open up CAA play just 10 days later at home against Drexel on March 13th. And finally, the regular season finale is April 10th against Northeastern in Boston, Massachusetts. Just a few days separated, a few weeks separated, rather, from their first matchup against Northeastern in Boston on March 21st. And then the CAA tournament comes around, semifinals April 15th, Ryan, and things are really looking different, as we mentioned, in this new season with the new scheduling that's going on here. Yeah, we talk about the conferences in North and South Hofstra, of course, with Northeastern, Delaware, and Drexel. I think they really have it easy. I think they can top this division with ease. I mean, Drexel, yes, they struggled against last season, had a one-all draw, but they beat Delaware both in the regular season and in the quarterfinals, and they beat Northeastern as well, so they face them twice. I think they have an easy ride to the semifinals where they're either going to take on James Madison or UNCW, and I'd, I'd rather really face off against the UNCW in the semis, and then that sets up a rematch in the final you know, of 2018, 2019. It's been a reoccurring theme, so we'll see if they can get it done. Yeah, Ryan, it's a tough conference nonetheless, but I think the Pride are well acquitted for what they have and well equipped coming up for what they have coming up on the schedule to go. So, again, that was our deep dive into the Hofstra Pride men's soccer program. But, Ryan, we know it doesn't just stop with Hofstra. they got to get through some teams in the CAA, as you mentioned. And for that, we have Tony Genualdo and Carlos Silva taking us beyond the Pride. It's been five years since the Hofstra Pride last won the CAA championship. After coming up short last season, the Pride look to get back to the promised land. But they have a plethora of obstacles still in their way. Here's Maher, he's got room. That's Takes it. the shot, score! It's over! JMU number five, Nicholas Maher! It's no secret that the defending CAA champion James Madison Dukes have a lot of star power. Some players, like defender Tom Judge and goalkeeper TJ Bush, even got the call from the MLS in this year's Super Draft. But they will each return to finish their senior seasons with the program. Joining Judge in the backfield will be Melker Anselm, who earned all CAA second team honors as a sophomore last season. It's not all good news for the Dukes, however, as the departure of leading goal scorer and CAA Player of the Year Manuel Ferriel will leave a huge gap up front. 
head coach Paul Zazenski could heavily rely on Clay O'Bara and Tyler Clegg, who each earned all CAA honors last season, to carry the load. It'll be Reynolds, the lefty, and the ball towards the net and headed in! By that's Alejandro Saez for UNCW. It got away from the Drexel defense, and it's 3-1 Seahawks. Last season's runner-ups in the CAA tournament, the UNCW Seahawks are starting this season with a different look as several of their key players in the attacking side of the field have graduated. One thing that does stay the same, however, is sophomore goalkeeper Gabriel Parada. Parada is coming off a season where he led the conference with a .73 goals against average. To help replace the loss of scoring up front, senior forward Jacob Evans, who scored two goals and knocked four assists last season, will be looked upon to step into a bigger role as the team's main forward this upcoming season. In the midfield, Colton Pleasance, who is coming off a season that earned him an all-rookie team selection in the CAA, should see even more minutes as one of the main creative pieces that UNCW is able to use to bolster their attack. Salongo will send it in, and it around and off the inside panel, and the Tribe takes the lead on the corner. The William & Mary Tribe finished last season fourth in the CAA, losing to the eventual champions in the semifinals. Leading goal scorer Julian Nago is no longer with the team, but sophomore Alexander Levengood is sure to pick up the slack. He scored 10 goals his freshman year, along with two assists. Another player who made a name for himself as a freshman last season was Alfredo Bozolongo. He tied the conference high for assists last season with seven, earning CAA third team honors in the process. A strong start for the Tribe this season could lead the team to their first CAA title in three years. Long story short, the Pride are ready to go for this CAA season, unlike any other before. For WRHU Sports, I'm Tony Genualdo. And thanks again to Tony Genualdo and Carlos Silva for that look beyond the pride into the CAA. Ryan, before we go, give me some thoughts on the season to come for the Hofstra Pride. Here's a bold take. That Syracuse loss is going to be their only one of the regular season. Non-conference seems to be, well, I think the toughest matchup there will be against Stony Brook. You know, you have this Long Island rivalry, but in terms of conference play, again, lucking out, not taking on UNCW or James Madison until the tournament. Ryan, if what you say does come true, I believe this is this is something that I've been crafting, been thinking about for a little bit. This Hofstra Pride team, I think, does have the ability to go the distance for the rest of the season. In terms of the CA tournament, let's just say something, let's, let's just say the Hofstra Pride fight another heartbreaking loss to JMU. I still think this team is NCAA tournament worthy, where if they do run that table, and God forbid they ever fall in the CAA championship match, I still think they can go to the NCAA tournament. They are that strong of a team, and I think this schedule they have up ahead gives them a strong enough resume to be an NCAA worthy team. I see it. I can see it happening this year, Ryan. We're going to put it down right now. We can mark it right here. It sure will be a very, very exciting season. Well, that'll do it for our men's soccer uh, half hour of the fall sports preview show in the spring, but many things to go around first. Taking us around the world of sports was our update man, Tim Crowley. Behind the board and pushing all the right buttons was Michael Corson. Taking us beyond the pride was Tony Genualdo and Carlos Silva. And producing all two hours of this preview show was Kayla McKechnie. Be sure to tune into the second part of our preview show next week, where we cover all spring sports, including men's and women's lacrosse, baseball, and softball. At the same time as this show, 7 to 9 on 88.7 FM WREQ. For my partner, Andrew Mordolo, I'm Ryan Ginio. Thank you for tuning in to the fall edition of the preview show. And remember to roar with pride. Proudly broadcasting from the Richard Philip Cavallaro Studio. W-W-R-H-U. Hempstead. You discovered. You discovered. A cornerstone of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication. W-W-R-H-U.